All right. Welcome, folks. Uh, I see folks are still trickling in a little bit, but I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started because we've got a full agenda and a great uh, lineup here today. Welcome uh, to this panel event hosted by the Center for Climate and Security, which is focusing on turning plans into actions on the topic of climate security and the FY23 budget request. My name is Aaron Sikorsky. I'm the director of the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a nonpartisan research institute of the Council on Strategic Risks. We've been around for a little over a decade looking at this nexus of climate change and, and national security issues. And I'm really excited about today's panel, not only because of the title from Moving from Plans to Action, which my colleague uh, John Conger is going to speak about in a minute in more detail, but also I'm really excited to be here because this panel underscores that tackling climate security is not just a task for the Department of Defense, but it's a task for all of the US national security and foreign policy agencies and requires leveraging multiple tools in the US toolbox to, to tackle. Climate security, of course, includes ensuring things like uh, making sure military bases and installations are resilient. But it goes well beyond that, and that's what the conversation today is going to highlight, right? Everything from uh, climate finance as a climate security tool in that the right adaptation investments and in at-risk locations can build resilience and prevent conflict. Also, the fact that helping developing countries pursue smart, clean energy solutions helps them avoid instability that could be associated with the energy transition. And of course, climate security is about tack tackling risks here at home as well. I mean, everyone has seen the news or are living through it right now of the heat waves sweeping uh, the country this week and into next week. And it's clear that investments in climate adaptation and resilience, including things like hazard mitigation grant programs for vulnerable communities, are also a critical component of homeland security and climate security programs. The Biden administration's executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad was very clear when it came out at the very beginning of the administration. Climate change considerations must be integrated across the US national security apparatus. And every agency has a critical role to play in preparing for and preventing climate threats to America and Americans. I'm so looking forward to hearing from our panelists today for this whole of government approach to climate security and how the fiscal year 23 budget request will help their agencies succeed. I'm happy now to turn the mic over to my colleague, John Conger, who's going to talk a little bit more about plans to actions and then introduce our excellent panelists. Thank you all again for joining today. A note that this is on the record. It is being recorded and there will be some time for questions at the end. But now I'll, I'll turn it to you, John. Thanks, Aaron, and uh, thanks to each of our speakers for being here. I'll introduce them all in a second. So as Congress ramps up to mark up its annual appropriations bills and, and uh, for DOD, the annual authorization bill, uh, it seemed like a, a good time to focus on the administration's proposed uh, budget for climate investments. So as you may know, we recently published at CCS a, a, a report entitled Challenge Accepted, which included uh, an assessment of the administration's progress in climate security, measuring against our 2019 report, which was a climate security plan for America. And it included lots of new recommendations for the way ahead. Uh, it was endorsed by dozens of security experts to include former intelligence agency directors, senior officials from DOD, former ambassadors, and many retired generals and admirals. Uh, challenge accepted speaks to the need to provide adequate resources, to provide transparency on metrics, to invest in models that allow better foresight, to in integrate climate considerations into regional planning processes, and to build capacity to ensure stability, um, to amplify resilience efforts across both civilian and military infrastructure, and, and a lot more. And as we uh, evaluated progress in that report, the bottom line was that the administration was definitely saying the right things and it was sending the right signals, but it was time to move from words to deeds and from plans to action. And frankly, that means budget. In fairness, we published that report just as the administration was receiving its FY22 appropriations, several months late, I might add, and publishing the FY23 budget request that we'll be talking about today. And that's the trick. You know, there's an old saying that strategy without budget is hallucination. 
Um, well, the panelists all have their strategies and, uh, and the budget request. And I think we're all eager to hear about how you're gonna take this funding and make a real difference in, in this portfolio. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists at the outset and then turn to each of them for some opening remarks. Uh, then we'll take some questions from the audience and maybe uh, one or two with moderator privilege uh, as well um, once they've had a chance to speak. So um, our four speakers. Uh, first, we have Joe Bryan. Joe serves as the Chief Sustainability Officer and Senior Advisor for Climate to the Secretary of Defense. Prior to his appointment, Joe Bryan was the principal at a boutique consulting practice focused on clean energy technology and its intersection with natural, national security. Uh, Joe previously served, and, and you know I knew him well when he was in this role, served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, where he was responsible for policies uh, related to the department's installation and operational energy programs. Uh, Joe has consulted on energy policy in Southern Africa and began and his career working on electricity restructuring and state level policies to encourage the growth of clean energy markets. Uh, our second speaker is Teresa Pullman. Uh, Dr. Teresa R. Pullman is the Executive Director of Sustainability and Environmental Programs at Headquarters Department of Homeland Security. She was the Environmental Division Chief at Headquarters Air Force in the past and, and managed the Air Force's $1 billion environmental program, including cleanup, compliance, conservation, and pollution, pollution prevention for all bases in the United States and overseas, including international bilateral agreements with Russia, Norway, Argentina, and Italy. Um, previously, she served as an Air Force Regional Program Manager uh, with the Air Force Base Con uh, Conversion Agency for a $300 million program um, concerned with base closure and disposal issues, uh, closing five Air Force bases. And then prior to the DOD, she worked for several defense contractors, uh, Rockwell International and NASA. Um, our third speaker is Gillian Caldwell. Uh, Gillian serves as the Chief Climate Officer and is responsible for directing and overseeing all climate environmental work across USAID. Uh, she also serves as Deputy Admi Assistant Administrator overseeing the Center for Environment, Energy and Infrastructure and the Office of Environmental and Social Risk Management. Uh, prior to joining USAID, she served as CEO of Global Witness, which has a focus on tackling climate change and deploys investigations into corruption and natural resource extraction to drive uh, systems change worldwide. From 2007 to 2010, she launched and led One Sky, a highly collaborative cross-sector campaign with over 600 allied organizations to pass legislation in the US to address the climate crisis. And last but not least, we have Jesse Young. Uh, since February 2021, uh, Jesse Young has served as a senior advisor to the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Prior to that, he was the climate change policy lead at Oxfam America, a global anti-poverty nonprofit. And he previously served as senior advisor in the Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the US State Department where he was part of the team that helped negotiate the Paris Agreement in 2015. Prior to that, he worked as a policy advisor for US Senator Chris Murphy, where he focused on environment, energy, and transportation issues. And he uh, uh, holds a master's degree in global policy from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. So that is our panelists. We are going to have a great uh, show today. And first, uh, we have Joe Bryan uh, up for some opening remarks. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to you and Aaron and, and the and the whole CCS team. You know, you guys have had the focus on this issue for for a long time and have been leading the pack for years. So, uh, ringing the alarm bell on climate and its impacts on national security, uh, it gets uh, it, it's a more important job every day. But you guys have been at it for a while, so appreciate appreciate the the focus on that. Now look, what this group has known for a long time and what we're all waking up to um, are those implications, right? Um, and the imperative to do something about them. And that's not just because we, uh, we care about the future of the planet, which frankly would seem uh, reason enough, but it's because we care about national security. And that's what this discussion is really about. So uh, what we see here at the Department of Defense um, 
simply is that climate change is dramatically increasing the, the demand for military operations and at the same time impacting our readiness and our ability to meet those demands while imposing uh, unsustainable costs on the department. Now that's not news to this group. Um, increasing temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, more frequent, intense, and unpredictable extreme weather are exacerbating existing risks and creating new challenges to US interests around the world. And I think it's uh, fair to say that those risks are growing. Um, and to train, fight, and win in this increasingly complex environment, we must, we must consider climate impacts at every level of our enterprise. And that means in every theater and every COCOM. Uh, the truth is that climate change is setting the context for the range of national security challenges that we face today and will increasingly confront in the years ahead. Um, but let's be clear, our challenges are not just in climate impacts on the physical environment. Climate change is altering technology and markets as the world adjusts to the reality and a rapidly advancing energy transition. Now, it may be obvious, but it's also important to remind ourselves that climate change not only sets the context for our operations, but also those of our allies and partners, and importantly, our competitors and our adversaries. And the nations, the alliances that are most resilient, that are best able to manage that change will secure an advantage. And truth be told, that must be us. But ensuring that outcome, ensuring that outcomes means that we have to change. We need to invest in change. Look, the update, John mentioned that the Center for Climate Security issued an update to its uh, Climate Security Plan for America earlier this year um, and recognized how far we in the Biden administration have come in the first year in making climate a national security priority. I, I think that that's honestly, I think that's um, praise well earned. Um, the president has really staked out a leadership position on this and changed the dialogue around this, as has the secretary and, and deputy secretary Hicks. But the report also recommended that we now resource that ambition. Because as John said, the plan without resourcing is, uh, is delusion. So that's what we're doing. Um, and I know this discussion today is about the president's uh, fiscal year 23 uh, budget request. And the Department of Defense's portion of that budget request makes significant, significant new investments to make our installations and operations more resilient to climate change and other threats, to increase the capability of our missions and our platforms, and to ensure the United States competes for the technologies that will define the future. I think it's fair to say that the president's fiscal year 23 budget request represents and reflects a turning point in how the Department of Defense thinks about climate and the mission. And in the process, it lays the lie to the idea that there's competition between what's good for the climate and what's good for the mission. The truth is that our climate investments are not only aligned with mission objectives, increasing resilience and enhancing combat capability, but those investments are absolutely necessary for future mission success. Now look, we can get into the details during the discussion, but just to give you a few highlights into the budget request that went up to the Hill. It contains four categories of investments. $2 billion for installation resiliency and adaptation. And that's headlined by a more than $550 million investment in the Energy Resilience and Conservation Improvement Program. It's a really important program. We can talk about the details of that. It invests $28 million in contingency preparedness. This is something that's been mentioned in uh, numerous uh, CCS reports. And it includes things like inc incorporating climate risks into war games and exercises. It includes things like black start exercises to identify vulnerabilities to installation power systems. It involves humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and defense support to civil authorities activities. And it includes a down payment 
on the Defense Environmental International Cooperation Program, DIAC, to expand our work with allies and partners. The budget request includes nearly $250 million in operational energy and buying power to improve the efficiency of our operational platforms while increasing their capability and mitigating logistics risk. And the budget request includes more than $800 million in science and technology investments to keep the Department of Defense at the cutting edge. That includes things like hybrid tactical vehicles to enhance capability like extended range and persistence and provide silent watch. It includes investments in new, new technologies like blended wing body aircraft that have the potential to provide capability through increases in range and payload while improving efficiency. Now look, these investments ref reflect the priority that this issue carries in the department and in the administration and put us in a position to make real progress against our climate and mission objectives. That said, let's make no mistake. From Lake Mead to Lake Chad, the climate crisis is accelerating. In our, in our work to create a military prepared for the challenge of operating in increasingly challenging climate conditions has to keep pace. Thanks for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Joe, and I appreciate all that detail on, on what you're actually uh, getting into. Um, we can get into the details on that in the discussion. I think next we're gonna go to Teresa, uh, talk a little bit about what uh, DHS has planned. Great, okay, thank you, John. Um, I, I will modify your statement that was made up front. Um, I think that strategy without budget is exhaustion. <laughs> And, and it is you know, definitely taxing our people. Um, first of all, I wanna say what an honor it is to be a part of this panel. Um, this is very, my esteemed colleagues are very, um, very helpful. And I know that they're gonna have some very valuable uh, comments. I, I already learned a lot <laughs> from, the, from the previous uh, presentation. You know, I've been with DHS for about 16 years. And uh, that ever since about 2006, and so have had the privilege of standing up a lot of these programs, energy, sustainability, re, you know, resilience, climate, and whatever, and environmental compliance, uh, environmental planning, historic preservation, environmental justice. And this particular time is a real milestone for the department and a recognition from the White House and Congress that we're making strides and, and they support us. In, and need to continue our efforts. For us, uh, our resilience plan, which we call a re resilience framework, has been the underpinning for our climate action plan. Okay, so back a few years ago, um, we launched a department-wide effort that included all of our diverse missions and served as a unifying concept for mission operations and support. Our purpose was to demonstrate that security, mission essential functions, resilience, and climate change and sustainability are inseparable and will support sustainability and sustainment of the mission in the future. And we're, we're using this work in resilience as an underpinning foundation. Since Katrina, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, there was a notable shift in emphasis from protecting critical infrastructure to also ensuring that communities and federal agency infrastructure are resilient. Disasters such as wildfires, volcanic eruptions, high heat and floods, all have potential impacts on the resilience of the department, but also on the resilience of our people and our communities. Our national response was in many ways unprecedented. It was the largest air and sea mission, largest commodity mission, largest medical response mission, and the largest power mission on US soil in 2017 and 2018 for the hurricane seasons. You may recall that Puerto Rico was devastated um, by Hurricane Maria. The historic scale, scope, and impact of these disasters helped us realize that we need to bring together all of our components to incorporate lessons learned, best practices, and enhance our operational resilience. 
as a working group dedicated to climate and security. I'm, I'm pretty sure that resonates with everybody. Um, we do have a lot of diverse missions in the Department of Homeland Security. You know, the most familiar one is probably TSA, the Transportation Security Agency that you all encounter in airports. But you, you're familiar with Coast Guard, Secret Service, USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Customs and Border Protection, uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, where incidentally, not just federal law enforcement is trained, but also state and local uh, law enforcement officers are trained. So we have quite a diverse mission. FEMA, of course, is part of the department, uh, and they have been uh, lending their resources and time to helping with uh, the climate crisis. Our resilience framework provides an analysis of mission critical assets and mission critical functions through the uh, lenses of climate effects, cybersecurity and communication, energy and water, transportation and physical infrastructure. What this really does is it helps us to prioritize solutions and projects for the greatest impact on mission effectiveness and also contributes to prioritizing mission essential assets by identifying vulnerabilities, gaps and closing these gaps. It establishes guidelines for implementing, monitoring, and identifying DHS resilience and readiness. As I stated previously, we are using this resilience framework as the foundation for our climate action plan or CAP, and we provide in integrated solutions through plans and projects for the greatest impact and effectiveness. We produced our first ever climate action plan actually in 2013, um, which was comprised of 36 implementation actions, 18 near-term and 18 long-term. The plan aligned with the vision of the prior administrations, the pr President Obama's climate action plan. The urgency of protecting our infrastructure and security against the increase and frequency of hurricane, massive flooding, excessive heat temperatures, wildfires, and severe drought has been a priority for a long time. I'm just telling you about this history so that you know it's we didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, climate, there it is, right? <laughs> it's actually been around in our mission space for a long time. We continue this priority and attention to the climate crisis in our 2021 Climate Action Plan and continue to progress in our programs. Secretary Mayorkas issued a policy statement supporting our Climate Action Plan and signed it as required in accordance with White House CEQ instructions. We've also had a lot of support through the past years in our equity and climate resilience efforts. Our environmental justice strategy was also signed by the secretary for the very first time uh, in July. And the resilience framework was signed by the undersecretary for management. We form wonderful partnerships. We work with our Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties to adjust to develop the EJ strategy. And we partner with the Office of Operations. See, one of the things that um, we need to do throughout the department, and, um, and I'm sure that all of you have encountered this before, um, is kind of make it real, okay? Try to make the, the idea, the concept of climate and national security real to the mission. And so part of what we've done is tried to do that. Um, we've also worked with our Office of Policy, and um, we have five adaptation areas in the Climate Action Plan, and we have these priorities. We continue to witness firsthand storms, flooding, and wildfire surges throughout the United States and their effects on our mission-critical assets. Therefore, recognizing these risks, my office has spearheaded or supported vulnerability and adaptation assessments for climate impacts on energy and water systems, facilities, information and communication technology and transportation. And I can't emphasize the regional aspect of this enough. You know, we, we know that there's, there's a certain, um, there's a virtue in analyzing individual assets on their own for vulnerabilities, but there's a lot more application uh, if you do it on a regional basis. Some examples of how we are incorporating climate adaptation planning into our Homeland Security mission areas the United States Coast Guard Arctic Strategic Outlook was in 2019 established three lines of effort crucial to achieving long-term success. Enhancing capability to operate effectively in a dynamic Arctic domain, strengthen the rules-based order, and innovate and adapt to, pro to promote resilience and prosperity. We also have the crisis information framework that our science and technology folks have come up with. We also have regional resilience assessment FEMA Community Resilience Guide, 
the DHS resilience framework, FEMA hazard mitigation, mass migration strategy that Citizenship and Immigration Services put together with the United States Coast Guard. So as the third largest department in the federal government and the nation's largest law enforcement agency, we're uniquely positioned to make a difference. We also have, um, have set the goal, just, just in case you hadn't heard, uh, for 50% of our vehicles to be electric by 2030. We're gonna work with other federal agencies across the interagency to secure the global supply chain while securing its smooth functioning. We are working with uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security National Risk Assessment Program and engaging in communities with environmental justice concerns to better understand and prevent disproportionately adverse impacts related to services and supply chain disruptions. Um, I wanted to say, to tell you all, um, now let's get to the money. Okay, so I don't have um, like a lot, of the, uh, the eye-watering <laughs> totals that Joe had and, and Joe, um, great, great that DOD has the budget. I know I worked for Air Force for a number of years. But, you know, DHS is going from zero to about 120 in about three seconds. <laughs> so we've got $55 million that has been um, allocated in the budget for climate change. 50 million of that is for sustainability and energy projects. Um, 2 million of that is to establish a project management office for climate change. And then we have $3 million for PFAS and working on PFAS and PFOA areas. So I hope I have given you all a picture of what the uh, Department of Homeland Security is working on. We uh, focus on priority areas and programs, and um, we have resources that we haven't had before. And so go on from zero to 120 in about three seconds. That's what we're doing. So back over to you, John, and thank you again for the privilege of speaking here. Thanks so much. And, and it is... Uh... It was fascinating listening to all of the things you're mentioning that we talk about on a regular basis, whether it's uh, migration impacts or Arctic strategy or, or a whole host of others, uh, resilience certainly and, and hurricanes. So this is, is all very much in line with the, the security conversation. Um, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we're gonna hear from Gillian uh, from USAID. Thanks so much, John. And just to reiterate um, the thanks um, expressed by my colleagues for the opportunity to speak here to the fiscal 23 budget on climate, which is so critically important. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the chief climate officer at USAID. And um, we're, of course, the world's uh, largest international development agency. And um, as Administrator Power has said on many recent occasions, we are a climate agency now. Um, President Biden, in fact, encouraged all federal agencies to think about what they can do to tackle this extremely existential crisis. And where USAID's concerned, it just couldn't be more imperative that we do so. Um, climate change touches everything we do uh, as a development agency. Um, you know, as temperatures and sea levels rise, the people whose lives we are seeking to serve are increasingly upended or cut short by droughts and storms and fires and floods. Their schools are closed due to pandemics. Um, and, you know, there's significant concerns regarding increasing poverty uh, for the poorest and most marginalized people around the world. Um, without urgent action, climate change actually threatens to push an, an additional 100 million people into poverty by 2030. Um, and really shockingly, by 2050, an estimated um, half or more of the world's population may not have sufficient water for at least an entire month a year. Um, it's just stunning how seriously um, the you know the the carbon in the atmosphere is affecting us all every single day, and um, we've got a very robust plan which we just launched at USAID. Um, our climate strategy takes us through 2030 and really mandates a whole of agency response to the crisis. I'm going to speak about um, a few different areas, um, and of course start with. Um, our work on climate security, um, migration, conflict, and instability. So, um, you know, we, we obviously see investments in these areas as critically important in tackling climate change. Um, 
and as making us uh, you know, safer uh, abroad as well as at home, um, not just from extreme weather, but from conflict and migration and instability directly caused by climate change, um, you know, scarce resources are drying up, competition's becoming more intense and, and greater numbers of people are displaced. Our own intelligence community, I mean, we heard from Joe earlier, but um, climate change has been described as a threat multiplier. And since 2010, weather emergencies have forced more than 21.5 million people to move globally. 90% um, of refugees come from countries that are the most vulnerable to climate change. It's floods, cyclones, and droughts making food and water more scarce and keeping refugees from being able to return home. So, um, you know, these climate induced disasters are, are magnifying when, um, you know, when, when, when the climate is, um, when we're experiencing extreme weather events. And we've seen this impact our southern border. Um, farmers in Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras just can't grow crops as the climate exacerbates already difficult conditions. Um, but, you know, as, as was emphasized in the recent Summit of the Americas by the U.S. government, when migration does occur, you know, it's, it's a real priority for the U.S. that it be safe and orderly and legal and humane. And, um, and we see that as a cross-cutting issue. So, we are working through this climate strategy and with our partners around the world to address the acute factors causing forced displacement and driving irregular migration. So looking, of course, at the natural disasters, food and water insecurity, long-term chronic challenges like poverty um, and armed violence, human rights abuses, and, and more. Um, just to give you a concrete example of what that programming looks like, um, when we're talking about drought and economic insecurity, for example, um, we have worked with SERVIR, the SERVIR program, which is a close collaboration with NASA to bring highly sophisticated satellite data to the table, which has enabled Kenya to reduce the data collection costs of information pertinent to microinsurance for smallholder farmers by 70%. So, our ability to predict and understand forthcoming weather and patterns, which is um, generated by automated data that SERVIR is delivering to the Kenyan government, has enabled Kenya to increase the number of farmers who are insured against crop loss from 905 years ago to 1.4 million today. Um, obviously, if you're insured against crop loss, you're more likely to stay in place. Um, and that will, of course, reduce the instability that can be generated by climate change. In another example, in the Karamoja region of northern Uganda, um, you know, we've seen frequent uh, conflict between herders and communities over access to water and pasture for livestock. So when we know that there will be forthcoming um, challenges with respect to pasturage or water, we can be proactive through our conflict prevention and security program and our other programming to work together with local communities to support resource sharing agreements as a means to um, you know, be proactive in addressing issues that are likely to precipitate conflict. Um, I think where we talk about climate and um, conflict or climate and uh, especially migration, it's so important to note that the vast majority of climate related migration is expected to be internal within country borders and that migration is a valid and proactive adaptation option for some people facing in increased climate risk. Um, of course, we wanna do all we can to mitigate that need to adapt in that way because uh, people typically don't want to leave the place they call home. But that leads me to PREPARE, which is another critical initiative. This, of course, was uh, the initiative announced by President Biden at COP in Glasgow. It's the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience. And um, the fiscal 23 budget includes $1.1 billion in climate adaptation funding, which is so critical. Climate adaptation funding has been severely um, hit, you know, in recent in recent years and administrations, and the pro, the prepare program that lo launched at COP really um, committed to reaching half a billion people who are vulnerable to climate change with increased adaptation and resilience by 2030, 
And um, you know, USAID is a lead implementer of that program. We're working closely with our colleagues at state to shape how the broader interagency will engage. Um, and that's critically important. So, you know, restoring that adaptation funding under the Biden administration fiscal 23 budget is incredibly important. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, that, and that request does include a very sizable increase, I think up 400% compared to fiscal 21 for direct adaptation resources. Um, the, the, those resources will really be targeting lower income countries facing the highest climate risk. So we'll be supporting climate services and early warning, like I discussed earlier, um, through initiatives like SEVERE, the Famine Early Warning System Network, or FUSENET, um, the, flat, the Flash flood, flood Guidance System, and Disease Early Warning System. So big emphasis in PREPARE on information services in line with the UN's um, commitment to ensure that everybody worldwide has access to relevant um, climate information. We only have a fraction of the global population that has the data they need to save lives and livelihoods. Um, in addition, um, that adaptation funding will really be used to mainstream and integrate adaptation. Um, so we'll be developing new partnerships and programs um, specifically focused on the so-called national adaptation plans or NAPs and the nationally determined contributions or NDCs under the Paris Agreement. And we've got to move beyond talk to action. So we're going to be focused on really supporting our host countries. We have a presence in 100 countries worldwide, missions in 80 countries to strengthen equitable climate resilient water resource management and wash services and really ensure the humanitarian peace building and targeted climate assistance that's uh, very coherent in fragile climate affected contexts. Um, the next area to emphasize, which also, you know, it, it relates to national security, of course, is, is mitigation and energy security. I mean, nobody needs to be reminded of the war in Ukraine and of um, the kind of the, the force and influence of a petro state like Russia and the dependency on that foreign oil and gas as a, as a key challenge. But uh, Mitigation of carbon emissions is also a key challenge because unless we keep global warming to 1.5 degrees or less, which is, you know, our window for doing that is increasingly scant, um, we're going to face much more drastic consequences than we're already seeing. So we can't just be on the defensive. We have to take aggressive measures to dramatically reduce global emissions. Um, in the US alone, we had 20 separate $1 billion climate related disasters in 2021 alone. So it's just penny wise and pound foolish not to make these investments for our own national economy and for the stability of the global economy. So we have a heavy emphasis, um, both in the State Department and at USAID on reducing emissions through climate mitigation measures. So the fiscal 23 request includes 636 million in direct mitigation funding for clean energy and, and natural climate solutions programs. Um, that's important because our uh, 2030 goal for climate mitigation includes um, 6 billion uh, carbon uh, metric tons of carbon uh, emissions equivalent. So, uh, you know, 6 billion tons, that's equivalent to almost the entire US emissions in a given year that we're looking to reduce. And 5 billion of that 6 billion will be achieved through natural climate solutions, especially um, deforestation. And I'm gonna get um, to that in a second. But um, through our energy programming, you know, it's a lot of work on energy security, decarbonization needs, the technical assistance for energy sector reforms, um, creating open renewable energy markets, um, and developing sort of financially viable power systems with the appropriate levels of redundancy to um, accommodate renewable energy. So, um, you know, we have a lot of emphasis on the energy program. And through that work, um, we will actually, we, we will achieve more than 100 billion in public and private investment by 2030. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute as well, but so incredibly important to stimulate private investment in climate finance. We've got a huge gap looming um, and public coffers just simply can't fill, can't fill the bill. Um, 
So uh, speaking of the natural climate solutions, as promised, um, you know, big emphasis in our budget on reducing deforestation, which is so critical, and uh, reducing unsustainable land use, uh, because that accounts for nearly one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we are very focused on conserving tropical forests, the lungs of the planet in places like the Amazon rainforest and the, the Congo basin. And USAID is the largest US government investor in global efforts to reduce deforestation. The fiscal 23 request for USAID includes 335 million in sustainable landscapes funding. Um, that's a 135% increase over fiscal 21 enacted levels. Um, so that, you know, those request levels will substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions and sequester carbon, which is so critically important. Um, okay, just about to wrap up here. On climate finance, um, as I mentioned, we're just nowhere where we need, nowhere near where we need to be. Um, the IPCC predicts we're going to need three to five trillion a year in climate finance by 2030. That's more than 500% greater than what we're seeing right now. Um, and as I've said, you know, I mean, if you'll recall, you're watching the debates uh, in COP in Glasgow, um, developing uh, countries are understandably frustrated that developed economies have yet to deliver on the 100 billion that was promised at Paris. And we're talking about a price tag of three to five trillion in mitigation and adaptation by 2030. So if we don't start focusing on how we mobilize uh, private finance with precious public dollars, we really have a problem on our hands. Uh, USAID aims to mobilize 150 billion in climate change mitigation and adaptation finance from the private sector and partner governments by 2030. Um, in just one such example, we have a new mechanism we're launching called the Green Recovery Investment Program. So we will leverage an investment of up to 250 million over five years to attract a 10x return, 3.5 billion in private sector financing. Um, and you know, we have over 20 mechanisms globally that can provide blended finance. We of course work very closely with the Development Finance Corporation um, through, through much of our um, blended financial transaction as well. Um, I think the other thing I just wanna underscore before closing is this, is the criticality of integration. So I've given you a bunch of numbers um, uh, when it comes to the budget, but if you look at the fiscal 21 budget for USAID, which I think is on the order of 27 billion, um, you know, the, the climate portion of that is a small fraction, I, I think only three quarters of a billion total. Um, what we're trying to figure out is how we deploy as much as possible of the broader USAID budget to tackle the climate crisis. Um, you know, we want to avoid substantial indirect attributions because those can undermine the ability of aid programming to deliver on its primary intentions, but we can find opportunities for co-benefits. And we are asking all of our plans and programs, our bureaus and our missions globally under the climate strategy to look at the, at the core targets we have, the 6 billion emissions reductions, the half a billion people we wanna reach through prepare, the 100 million hectares of, of land and forest we wanna preserve, um, you know, all of the um, 80 missions around the world working with our partner governments to, to deliver on those Paris agreements, um, you know, the, the NDCs. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to go beyond um, the, the fiscal 23 climate budget, um, which is a substantial and critically necessary increase. Um, we're just still nowhere uh, as far as we need to go on this, uh, on this issue um, or on addressing its fundamental connections to climate security. So let me wrap there and give it back to you, John. Thanks, Gillian. I um listening to all of the all of your conversation and all of this description it's really uh it's stark how much uh, our investment is necessary to um, maintain stability in certain parts of the world and to and to contribute to that um the destabilized the destabilizing impacts of uh you know climate stresses are are very salient and ccs has for a very long time advocated uh, higher numbers in your budget 
in order to be able to promote that stability abroad. Um, next, we're gonna go to Jesse uh, to, to bring us home, uh, talking uh, from the State Department perspective. Great, thank you so much for having me as well. And I really enjoyed all the other interventions here. I know at this point in the program, I assume folks just wanna to get to the Q&A section. So I'll try and be really brief. Other folks have mostly covered this ground well and, and Gillian especially. So I'll just add a few add a few points on the FY23 budget request and the process over here. Um, I, I should note that when we talk about climate and security and building resilience in emerging economies and things like that, people who aren't in this field, I know everyone on this call is in this field, but people often think about fast onset events like hurricanes and floods. In reality, most of the worst impacts of a warming world that Gillian was describing are slower onset events. They're desertification, they're rising sea levels, depletion of aquifers, and so forth. And so that's why the FY23 request and the state and USAID budget in particular prioritize a lot of the adaptation work that Gillian was talking about. It's less flashy, I think, a lot of the time than mitigation work. You know, you can't point to a solar array or a set of offshore wind turbines. But it's just as important, especially for a lot of developing countries that participate in the climate process and are feeling these impacts right now. Um, and the argument we make when we go to stakeholders, especially to Congress on this front, isn't just a moral case, because in my experience, when you make climate based arguments for climate action, you rarely reach new audiences and we want to be reaching new audiences all the time on this stuff. To, to share the message that stabilization is key to our national security and adaptation and resilient investments are one of the best ways to meet those needs for additional stabilization. Um, I should note that the 23 request makes substantial, substantial investments across a lot of key um, climate and security related multilateral funds, including uh, a big request for the Green Climate Fund, as well as the Adaptation Fund and the Least Developed Countries Fund, those latter two focus on funding smaller scale adaptation projects in a set of developing countries. And the request also looks for big increases in um, state and USAID climate spending that Gillian was just, uh, just describing across a range of core bilateral and, multi and plurilateral initiatives. I should also say that sitting in the carry office where I do, we did as much as we could to help try and knit together the interagency, not just at state and USAID, but at MCC and DFC and TDA and all these other agencies and treasury um, to make sure that we are putting forward significant requests for all the key accounts and funds that address climate and making sure this sort of works together in a kind of harmonious way. Um, because a lot of this resilience and adaptation work is typically harder to finance. It requires more on the ground project design than a lot of traditional energy and mitigation work. And it's just more resource intensive a lot of the time. For a lot of these funds, you know, for the for the SIFs, for the Clean Technology Fund, if you put in one US dollar, you can leverage four, five, six dollars of loan authority through that program. That's just not the case through much adaptation financing. So you actually need to really bring the upfront capital investment in a lot of these places. I think it's also important to realize, as everyone on this call knows, that we're entering what is going to be a very challenging budget season for foreign assistance. Setting aside the question of congressional control, um, there are challenges to getting more money for a lot of this work, at least on the foreign assistance side. And I certainly can't speak to the DHS and DOD side. Um, but you know we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. I don't think we performed as well as we wanted to in FY22, vice the president's request. And so we're really looking to do as much as we can to make up ground in FY23, realizing the political headwinds may be greater. I think it's also worth noting that when it comes to ESF and USAID funding more generally, um, these accounts are ones that are often earmarked to sometimes 100%, sometimes north of 100% by Congress, which means that varying by bureau and operating unit. If you look at a particular fund, Congress has specified where they want all of that money to go. So I understand that impetus. I did a lot of that work when I was in Congress, when I was out of government, I urged Congress to do a lot of that earmarking. In government, of course, though, it limits our flexibility to really sort of uh, surge funding to key geographies and prioritize immediate needs when Congress is stepping in with an understandable imperative to try and prioritize areas they care about or particular funding that they care about. So we should also realize that even when we talk about top line levels for funding, there's also a complicated effort we have to go to meet all the congressional directives off of many of which limited our ability to surge money into climate. Um, and I, I would also note, this is nothing that this group doesn't already know, but even in the best of times, arguing for substantial plus ups in development of foreign aid is tough sledding and difficult politics. Uh, across our key accounts, as I said, FY22 was really tough. 
um, you know, these compared to other parts of the budget, the amounts we're requesting here are pretty small. Uh, that said, there tends to be a lot of resistance to plussing up these accounts among certain members and key constituencies on the Hill. We're always working to overcome that, but we should realize obviously that what the president requests here does not become law just by the snap of our fingers as much as we would, much as we would like. Um, so we're cognizant of that, that we need to do better going forward. And we're also cognizant of the fact that we need to make arguments about this funding that resonate with non-climate audiences while also preparing to do more with less at times, or at minimum, do more with funding that rises only in an incremental fashion in certain key accounts. There are a lot of reasons for hope, though, I think, across this entire portfolio. Congress has proved exceedingly generous in funding emergency assistance for Ukraine and Eastern Europe in recent months, and energy security has been one of the key priorities for donor countries who are helping us address the crisis more broadly. There's a growing awareness of something that everyone in this community has already known, but it's dawning on other folks, namely that energy systems and fuel supplies can be a powerful tool for malign actors. Um, so why don't I stop there? Would love to get to questions. I hope you'll forgive me. I have to drop um, at 3 p.m., but hoping to hear as much of the call as I can. And again, thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Jesse. I think all of our panelists can now come on to the picture. Uh, I'll have you all here. I've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A, but maybe, uh, I'll use moderator's privilege for the first one and just say, you know, obviously y'all have billions of dollars you've just described, you know, uh, resilience money at DOD and, you know, the FEMA's got a couple billion dollars of, of resilience money, uh, USAID's, uh, you described billions of dollars, the Green Climate Fund, that's billions of dollars. Y'all have billions and billions here lined up. But my question is, um, by the end of FY23, what's what's something that that's going to buy that you can point to that we'll all be able to point to? Or are they more long-term investments? What are we going to be able to to see and touch? And you can ju jump in, you know, uh, any order you want. Uh, but what what are some examples of things that we can actually expect to see with this money? I'll jump in quickly on that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we've got extremely concrete outcomes we want to generate by 2030, and we will be monitoring our progress against those outcomes. So we will have concrete data regarding um, the progress we've made towards restoring 100 million hectares, reducing 6 billion tons, um, providing support on NDCs in 80 countries, uh, you know, reaching those half a billion people and more. Um, but one of the things that, um, you know, Spec Carey and the State Department have been so focused on is um, methane and reducing methane, a, short, a highly toxic, short-lived climate pollutant. And um, so USAID has really been doing kind of an inventory of our opportunities to make a difference there. And it's the methane emissions reductions that will have the most important near-term consequences given the dynamics of the chemistry, you know, reducing uh, fossil fuel use causes, you know, uh, a, a reduction in some um, in in some pollutants that uh, likewise reduce warming. But I'm sure Jesse wanted to speak to that, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Jesse. What uh, you uh, you got a cue? I know Teresa had her hand up uh, first, but why don't you why don't you jump in and just sort of carry this along? Yeah, I'll be really quick, just drafting off of what Gillian was said. I think one of the concrete outcomes is what she's referring to. Um, Secretary Kerry and the president have repeatedly convened uh, meetings of the major economies forum, which is basically the largest emitting countries in the world. These track pretty closely with the G20, but not entirely. Um, and the thing we're trying to do is for those countries that have not enhanced their climate ambition, which means come forward with new Paris targets, we're trying to go to them and demonstrate the availability of technical assistance and foreign assistance that can help them actually meet enhanced targets. Because as you know, this is a delicate dance with a lot of countries when they're not necessarily high income or high capacity countries, there's a political willingness, but there's not in country enabling environments, technical expertise, concessional finance, all of those things. And they will say to us, we're able to do this if the donor community is able to step forward in a place like South Africa, do a bunch of debt restructuring in their state-owned utility such that they can actually have a grid that is suited for, for injection of renewables. This is, a, this is a key limiting factor in most countries. It's not just building a bunch of renewable energy, it's making sure the country can actually off-grid take, take that energy from those new resources. So yes, that's one of the most concrete deliverables we'd be able to accomplish with FY23 funding is actually help countries make new commitments and meet them. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jesse. Teresa, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, it's, 
Of course, if we have the CR like we did this year, uh, several CRs, um, the, the progress uh, like uh, will be about six months in arrears, right? Um, as far as getting the, the funding. But I mean, we've we've done a lot in, in the planning process, so to speak. We've been planning and planning and planning for a long time. <laughs> And I love, I love the idea of, um, of this particular thing is, okay, so it's a call to action, right? And so what we're going to do with the funding in FY23 is to try to close the, the gap in the backlog of sustainable and energy projects, energy conservation measures. Uh, we have about uh, almost a billion dollars, say 650 to, you know, seven or 800 million dollars worth of a backlog. Of projects um, and, and sustainability, we got fifty million, which is good. I mean, it's better than nothing, and it's and it's something that we need to prove that we can use this money wisely. The other thing that um, that we'll do this year is um, is look at how this fifty million dollars can be applied to the mission space and prove mission relevance. You know, once again, make it real to the mission and operation of the department. There you get your credibility. What I would like to see is us building the foundation of credibility. And we're not the only ones. The sustainability and environmental and energy people are not the only ones trying to go after this budget. But everybody else, it becomes a cultural thing. And everybody else sees the validity of working for climate change and energy efficiency and effectiveness. Um, so... That's one of the things that I see um, that we're going to be able to do. The, the other thing is we're starting to um, try to make a dent in our 50% third-party financing, the alternative financing um, area. And we're really working with our contracting folks to try, try to get them trained up. We find that one of the problems is that our own contracting officers and even the lawyers and the CFO don't really understand the alternative financing process. And so we're going to try to really jumpstart that this year as well. Fantastic. Uh, Joe, you want to uh, give a couple examples? Things we can expect to see at the end, by the end of FY23. Yeah. Um, thanks, John. I think that, um, as you know, as, uh, military construction projects and, uh, and the pipeline of those are, are multi-year projects. So whether we'll see uh, uh, dirt turned on many of those in 23, I, I, think, uh, I think what we may see is that in addition to our 23 budget request, we were able to be reached back into 22 when we first came into, into the Pentagon and plus up some of the uh, key accounts for things like, uh, uh, things like ERSIP, the Energy Resilience Conservation Improvement Program. So I think what you'll likely see by 23 is you'll see a pipeline a very different kind of resilience projects. So I think our pipeline will look very, very different. Now, whether that results in turning dirt by the end of 23, I don't know. Um, I think the mitigation, some of the mitigation work, I think Jesse pointed out, it's, it's somewhat easier to see progress on that. So I know that over the past few years, you know, some of our capabilities here in the department have atrophied. Uh, um, it, was, it was mentioned uh, that third party financing capacity, our ability to make uh, those kinds of investments in our in our facilities, efficiency investments, renewables investments in our facilities using third party finance uh, uh, projects. That capacity is atrophied, and we've had to we pressed about forty million dollars into the budget to staff up the services to begin the process of building a new pipeline uh, for projects around energy savings, performance contracts, uh, enhanced use leasing to enable renewables and efficiency on our installations. So I think we're going to see that. What I think you're most likely to see is probably RFIs and RFPs hitting the streets uh, to, to put this money on requirements. And that ranges from things like, I think you're going to see big growth in things like our Operational Energy Capability Improvement Fund, which um, in FY21 uh, FY, um, was $16 million. And the budget request is $180 million. So I think you're gonna see a growth in opportunities for people to work with us to come up with solutions. The adaptation stuff obviously is a, is a bit longer of a turn. I think on the international uh, work, uh, the defense environmental uh, uh, international um, program is, um, is likely to produce, uh, we hope it'll produce a pipeline of uh, 
uh, projects that we can take on with our partners to make them more resilient um, and at the same time uh, Im improve our, our ability to carry out our own mission. So I don't know how much dirt we're going to see in 23, to be just perfectly honest, but I think you're going to see a lot of RFPs hitting the streets to get people working in the right direction uh, and not a, not a moment soon enough. A lot of pipeline and a lot of momentum. I, yeah. I, I can see it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start going through the audience questions. Uh, we, we had one, Joe, uh, looks like for you, how much coordination are you doing with utility companies? And, and this might be for, Tracy, you might be able to touch on this too. How much coordination with utility companies in order to have uh, EV charging put into place? Is that stuff you're funding internally? Are you working with utility companies? Um, and Joe, I'm going to throw one more on there because there was another utility question down below. Um, why uh, something about rural electric cooperatives and apparently they're no longer considered grantees under DSIP, uh, which is the Defense Community Infrastructure uh, Program. Um, you, you, can you touch on a couple of those things and maybe Teresa, if you want to jump in. Uh, can't comment on DSIP eligibility rules. I haven't looked at that R R RFP, but if somebody wants to send me a question, I'm happy to dig into it and, uh, and figure out what the, what the status of that is. Um, in terms of uh, electrification of our vehicle fleets, I think I, I can speak for the Department of Defense, but as federal agencies, we all have requirements under the executive order to begin electrifying our fleet. Um, by 2027, uh, we are, our light duty vehicle purchases are, 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 should, all be, uh, should all be zero emission vehicles. Um, for the Department of Defense, you know, we have a huge fleet, uh, setting, aside from the Postal Service, the largest in the government, so we have about 160,000 tactical vehicles in the department. And our particular challenge with respect to charging infrastructure is that it, our fleets exist inside of a fence line that isn't available to the commercial market. So sometimes the business case for, uh, for commercial charging is a little bit tougher for the department. But to the question, we, uh, our utilities are really critical partners for the department, like most uh, folks in the country, the Department of Defense relies on the commercial electricity grid to support our missions. And that includes uh, supporting and providing us the power we need to, uh, to run our electrified assets. And so we have a, a great relationships at the local level with our utilities, and we've been working with them quite a bit here at the, at the national level with the associations and with individual utilities that service a lot of our bases to figure out ways that we can work together on this on what I think is a mutual interest, I think the utility industry obviously has a lot of uh, has a lot of interest in in electrification of our uh, of, of vehicle fleets uh, more broadly. And so, yeah, we have we we do work with them. We're always open to work with partners on that stuff. Great, T Teresa, did you want to add something? Sure. Just, I mean, everything that Joe said, you know, is is, some, is what we are. You know, we're concentrating. We don't have um, the installations. You know, we, we do have campuses. Um, that um, that house uh, our you know components uh, by and large, but you know we're a real partner with GSA, the General Services Administration, and so we have um, over fifty percent, about fifty percent um, of our properties are leased from GSA, um, and we the Coast Guard actually owns about sixty percent of our owned portfolio. And so um, the Coast Guard, they do have installations very similar to the Department of Defense. So they, they would have the same kinds of issues, but um, certainly we are dependent on the grid. We're dependent on utility companies um, working with the Federal Energy Management Program. Um, we have an MOA to, to provide um, you know, technical exchange and working with the Federal Energy Management Program on this. I think that um, strategically, uh, what I see as as far as what the government needs to do is, you know, maybe, uh, and I know that FEMP is looking at this, the Department of Energy is looking at this, but, you know, I think that there needs to be a consideration of um, regionally, uh, just like getting back to your regional concept there, John, of, you know, kind of, uh, how do we consider regionally and working with CISA on their risk assessment process as to single point vulnerabilities um, with utilities as well. Um, we also need to concentrate on, you know, okay, so we have these charging stations that are dependent on utilities, but what happens in a contingency when we don't have um, the charging station? Do we need a solar powered uh, photovoltaic array to power up every single, you know, charging station? That's probably not a good use of funds or uh, a good, Synergy. And so I think that we need to be more strategic in our look um, with the utility companies and with the, these charging stations as well. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, Gillian, I'm going to go to you next. I've got a, a bunch of really insightful questions and comments from uh, at, our old friend of ours, Admiral Denny McGinn. And so I uh, let me let me read a couple of these out to you uh, for, for everybody's uh, benefit. Um, is USAID closely coordinating with the World Bank and IMF, uh, as well as with private sector global financial institutions to finance climate change mitigation and adaptation initiatives? And Denny also asked, um, you know, are uh, State Department and USAID teams familiar with RMI's Center for Climate Aligned Finance? Um, and he suggests checking that out. And there was one more. Um, and he also asked if USAID was providing alternative clean energy strategies to developing nations, because uh, they're often being approached by China to deploy coal-fired energy in the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, that's a cluster of questions for you, uh, sort of all along the same lines. Um, can you uh, take a shot at those? Sure. Um yeah, so I, I, I mentioned collaboration with the International Development Finance Corporation, but not with the World Bank and the IMF. Um, interestingly, USAID is, um, we have quite a lot of intersection with them because we are mandated by Congress to complete environmental and social impact analyses um, for projects proposed by multinational development banks, such as the World Bank. So, you know, we, we interface with them all the time, but, um, I just joined the steering committee for the NDC partnership and had a long conversation with the World Bank um, about their climate plans and joining as a climate observer on their forthcoming meetings to talk about their um, climate finance unit. Um, I think all of us in the um, climate finance community are really keen to see both the World Bank and the IMF do as much as possible. They do have ambitious targets with respect to climate related investments, but um, you know, there's there's always so much more to be done. So we're very keen to look for opportunities to collaborate there and to, um, you know, to ensure increased investment. Um, we are familiar with RMI. Um, that's the Rocky Mountain Institute, of course. Um, I had a great meeting at COP in Glasgow with them. One of the interesting things that RMI does uh, or is launching is something sort of um, colloquially referred to as like a Peace Corps for bankers. And the idea is to bring people skilled in finance and to house them inside um, some of the least developed countries and developing economies to help build the capacity of these countries to shape the pipeline and seal the deals when it comes to private investment. And I think that's so, uh, you know, such, such a critically important component of the work and something that USAID really focuses on is building capacity. It doesn't work to parachute experts in and disappear because you don't have that longevity. Um, and in terms of alternative clean energy strategies, absolutely. I mean, we house uh, quite a large interagency initiative known as Power Africa, for example, that's um, dedicated to tackling energy poverty in Africa that now has ambitious targets with respect to decarbonization. And um, you know, I often get questions when uh, I'm speaking with Congress about um, you know how we think about um, the issue of energy poverty um, and you know the, the need, the substantial needs that Africa faces um, when it comes to um, energy access. And the truth is that renewable energy is um, almost invariably, in the vast majority of the cases, we're working the cheaper option at this stage due to um, you know, prices that have gone down for relevant component parts where solar energy is concerned due to all the changes that have been taking place in the public policy environment that have created the right enabling environment for those kinds of investments. So we're absolutely heavily involved um, in shaping um, clean energy strategies. We also work closely with the National Renewable Energy Labs of the Department of Energy to commission um, you know, really thoughtful analyses of um, energy and to chart energy transition strategies, which in turn can be used as a persuasive argument for private investment. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, the next question I want to hit, uh, there, there's an inquiry here about how the private sector plays in all of this, especially small businesses, and how can they partner more effectively with your programs, or do they already? Um, and there's a note that there's extensive private capital available and interested uh, to be driven into some of these programs. Um, but you know how 
how do RFPs actually align with that kind of partnership mentality in this space? Joe, so that might be a little bit for you. So I guess the easiest uh, example to bring up again is our is our ability to leverage private capital to do uh, resiliency improvements on our installations um, through uh, contracting vehicles like energy savings performance contracts, which which DOE holds a contract on and which we have the authority to contract on directly. Um, Army Corps does a bunch of that. DLA Defense Logistics Agency does a bunch, and that is where we use private capital to make an investment in efficiency and resilience on our installations. And that um, investment is paid back through the energy savings um, that that investment itself produces. So that's a, a great way for us to leverage private capital, uh, particularly in those places like uh, improving our, our installation infrastructure, where we're never going to get the uh, appropriations necessary to keep those facilities at state of the art. So that's that is a uh, is an excellent place where um, uh, so energy savings performance contracts. We do similar things with things like enhanced use leases, making um, land available on our installations, leveraging the value of that land to allow private development. Uh, we've used it extensively on renewable energy. Denny McGinn, who's on the on the call and just asked a question, had really drove a lot of that work when we were at the Department of Navy years ago. We have some really good projects across the services that not only allow for renewable energy development, but also bring with them um, uh, resilience attributes that we as a department can leverage for the particular missions that are on a facility. So those are two areas where I think we're, we're best or, or well positioned to leverage private capital. Um, I, there, there's a host of others, but I'll, I'll kind of hand the, hand the mic over to others who may want to comment. Teresa, you got your hand up. Sure. I mean, and, you know, the same goes for DHS. You know, we looking at alternative financing, um, uh, making use of other, you know, other monies. We do not have a large amount of money to put into energy conservation measures to put into our projects. And so um, developing a partnership, our partnership with industry um, is going to require us to really concentrate on that 50 percent. Um, goal, you know, that, that just came out. And so we, uh, we're we going to be looking at establishing a center of excellence for um, alternative financing, energy savings performance contracts. I mean, we also have um, other, um, other things that we're trying to do, you know, as far as legislation is concerned. I uh, would, would love to get the enhanced use leasing authority like DOD has. <laughs> we do not have that. Um, we also do not keep 100% of our rebates uh, for energy uh, utility contracts. Uh, and so we, we only keep 50%. And so we have legislation that is operating to do that. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's the using the, um, you, m making better use and more efficient and effective use of energy savings performance contracts. And I would say that, so industry uh, and small businesses you know, uh, I think that the one of the approaches that would help us is that um, not every federal agency, and, and especially here in the Department of Homeland Security, is very well educated and, and very well schooled and lubricated in making these kinds of things happen. You know, energy savings performance contract alternative financing are almost every single case is a one-off, right? You've got lots of different situations, um, different parties funding, you know, those kinds of things. And the, the, the less, uh, I mean, the more uh, from a positive aspect, I guess the more we can make it understandable to others who are not in the business of energy and alternative financing, like our contracting officers, like our lawyers. I once had a lawyer tell me, this is illegal. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no, and I had to point him to the authority. This was a DHS lawyer that just didn't even, just didn't know about the authorities that we have. And so, part of what I need to do is is provide a better education on these alternative financing contracts and the ways to do it. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is also we've established, like I was talking about before, a very good partnership with the Department of Energy. And um, in using um, using these alternative financing contracts and getting our contracting officers trained, we've had several sessions over the past month 
in getting our contracting officers trained. I, ca I can tell you that Secretary Mayorkas is extremely interested in this, and um, he views it as one of the priorities to um, en enhance or advance energy efficiency within the department. And we see the alternative financing vehicle and PPAs as a way to do that. Great. Um, there's a there's a fun question here. I think that applies to everybody. It says, uh, you know, building off of uh, one of the earlier comments on reaching new audiences with communications, can each of the panelists give an example of a successful communications pitch for greater climate awareness and or funding um, that may be different than the common narratives in the press and Twitter? What, what uh, how do you make your funding, what's a good message for making this funding salient for new audiences? Anybody want to jump in? Joe, I wanted to catch you before you were, you know, I know you turned into a pumpkin here in a few minutes. I do, John, and I'll, I'll answer now. Um, so it's actually, it's a great question. And um, when you work at the Pentagon, that's an important question because we need to communicate to people who aren't uh, climate warriors, they're warriors, right? Um, and the most important thing we can do is make sure everyone understands the uh, alignment between what we wanna do for climate, what we need to do for climate, given the state of the world, and what we need to do for our mission, given the state of the world. And a, a good example of that is, is uh, improving the efficiency of our operational platforms. Look, um, our, we have what's called a, a joint warfighting concept, which has, has four uh, supporting concepts, one of which is contested logistics. And what that means is we, don't, we believe that um, we will not have a free pass to deliver the logistics into theater to the forces that need to do their job. Uh, we believe that that logistics system, including the fuel logistics, is going to be contested. So we may not be able to get what we need for the mission without, uh, without a resistance into theater. And the best way, one of the best ways to address an issue like contested logistics is to not require logistics in the first place. And so the more efficient we can make our platforms, the more we can rely on energy sources that don't require that logistics support, that don't require fuel or water deliveries into theater, the less vulnerable we make the mission. And so even if you don't care about climate, you should wanna improve the efficiency of your operational assets and your operations themselves, because that matters to the mission that's gonna keep people safe. I mean, look, we know that the army and, and Marines uh, face this in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we are gonna face it everywhere where we choose to put uh, forces or where we expect to be in coming years. Um, so aligning that message and communicating to people who may not agree with us on all of the climate related reasons for what we do uh, should agree on the mission. And I think that's the most important thing we can do within the department, uh, both in terms of bringing people along as to what we're doing and to bringing, uh, bringing budget to our budget to our mission on this is to align it with, with the key priority of the Department of Defense, which is to wish to fight and win, uh, prepare to fight and win wars. Uh, for this country. So that's that's something we do every day. And uh, I think it's a great question. Curious to hear what the others say. Teresa, Gillian, you want to jump in? Well, if we're still on the private sector engagement question, um, I would say that, um, you know, we really try to set the stage for U.S. private sector engagement. I mean, one perfect example is our work to set up renewable energy auctions. Um, you know, that's highly technical work, which creates the space for um, uh, you know, competitive, transparent auctions um, in which um, foreign governments can purchase renewable energy for future use um, at affordable prices. And um, of course, those auctions are open to uh, American industry and American bidders. Um, you know, we've got a big uh, task ahead of us when it comes to renewable energy supply chains, especially solar supply chains, um, because of course we have the Weaver Force Labor Protection Act, which precludes the importation of solar panels um, made in Xinjiang, China, because of the presumption those have been made with slave labor. So there's so much opportunity for business, American business and other business, especially with the right investments from Congress to, um, you know, to, to step into the breach um, on that front as well. Thanks. So John, um, talking about the communications question, um, you know, we, we kind of, 
I have sort of an unusual thing <laughs> that, that we're doing at the department and, and it is called the Climate Change Professionals Program. We, um, our secretary established an honors program for cybersecurity. And so in order to get a climate professionals um, within the department and, and have the department, you know, communication in the department and integrate climate um, security into the department, what we came up with is the idea of having climate change professionals. There is no series for climate change professionals in OPM. So we kind of, <laughs> we're kind of doing this on a shoestring and, um, and trying to, you know, figuring out sort of building the, the plane as we're flying it, right? <laughs> but uh, this January, we um, advertise for our first cadre of climate change professionals. We've got um, a cadre of 10 people that will be going through training um, with the Association of Climate Change Officers, and we will be integrating them into the components with, it, with their counterparts at the components and trying to help each component with, their, with the climate change mission. We're gonna have several other cadres throughout the years. And what we're gonna try to do is use these professionals to communicate the, the climate change mission and to help us really see alignment, help the components really see alignment with the climate change mission and, and climate change and national security. So that's, that's one thing we're doing. And the other thing is that um, we had an unusual situation happen uh, during hurricane, uh, the hurricanes in 2017 and 18. And that was the fact that we couldn't get um, fuels. Uh, our, our components were not able to get help from FEMA uh, because of the Stafford Act limitations that FEMA had because they work for communities and local and state governments. And so uh, we were not able to get fuels from uh, like a, a lot of the defense agencies were. And so what we decided to do in order to communicate the um, importance of contingency for climate change was to make something real, like an emergency fuels contract. And so we put that in place a few years ago and it's being used by our components very successfully to supply fuel to them. So, so I, guess, I guess the communication um, response for me is to make it more real and more integrated into the mission of the department because we do have several diverse missions. And so it's, it's incumbent on us to make it real to each one of these missions. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I've also found that you can't convince somebody to pay attention to something they don't care about. You have to make it relevant to what they already care about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to uh, bring back to Gillian here for, for a minute. There's a question here on the vice president's uh, recently announced plan on global water security uh, and how that might uh, contribute to global climate efforts. How is that gonna integrate with what USAID does uh, I know that's you know sort of fresh, but you guys probably had a, a part to play in its development. Um, how, how is the, how are those items in that action plan going to manifest themselves in in the projects going forward? Yeah, we do um, quite a bit on water security through our wash programming, for example, and water security has critical connects to you know human health. Um, economic livelihoods, uh, conflict. I mean, all, many of the issues we discussed at the outset. So, you know, we really applaud the Global Water Security um, Action Plan and USA will be a key implementing partner. In fact, Administrator Power recently made um, an announcement. It may have been at the Summit of Americas on new, um, new funding, new USAID uh, funding on water security. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely going to be active there. I think one of the challenges that we face in the, you know, in budget discussions is um, how we might use any um, new authorities for deviation with respect to earmarks. Um, and, you know, that leads to big debates. So, uh, you know, if you wind up targeting uh, water, a wash earmark for deviation to deploy funds elsewhere, what are the implications for the ability to do that um, very critical life-saving work? Um, so you know, when it comes to budgets, there's just so many trade-offs and discussions to be had and, and reasonable people can differ on, uh, on the most important investments to make. Um, that's why I think there's this real um, 
tension between, you know, an interest in having the top lines, which in, ensure that we have the money that we need for key priorities and the interest in having the latitude that our missions on the ground really need to advance their work as they see fit, given their six decades of experience in, in, in the context. We are approaching the end of our time here. We're under five minutes. I wanted to give each of you sort of a, a minute or so to, to wrap up before I give some closing remarks. Um, Teresa, you want to start and then Gillian, uh, just a, a last thoughts. Sure. In conclusion, I, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak with this group. I have a, I've learned a whole lot. I've been writing down a lot of things that my colleagues were talking about. And um, I just just want to say that um, for us at the Department of Homeland Security, we are moving forward with uh, climate change and integrating it into our mission and operational areas. Um, I, I want to underscore how, um, how important it is to make the, the mission, make climate change real. It's not just one of those tree hugging things um, that the, the green people, the environmental people are talking about, but get everybody talking about it. Um, the conversation has started, it's beginning, and it's turning from conversation into action. With this, with this budget this year, we actually have an opportunity to move the needle. Uh, there's, there's a lot more we can do, and um, we can do more with more funding, but I'm appreciative of the chance that we've been given to, uh, to do a lot of special things. We, we're a special department. We have a lot of different um, missions, disaster preparedness, um, disaster response. We have a search and rescue. We've got um, transportation security. We've got um, a cyber security. We, we have a border security, all kinds of things. Law enforcement is, is really our number one mission um, at the department. So um, all of these diverse missions, I believe, can be tied together um, under climate change and climate up climate and sustainability and resilience, because I think that they're all interwoven and together. This is a unifying concept. And I believe that we need to take advantage of, of, the, of the opportunity that we have now. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Gillian? You know, I've been worried about this issue for so long. And, you know, when I first started worrying about it, a lot of people weren't. and it's hard, it's a hard issue to focus on every day because emissions keep rising, even though we spend a lot of time talking about climate action. And we have just got to get beyond promises and rhetoric and to, into some real live action on this. I mean, we are, we are literally facing a planetary catastrophe. Look at the footage today of Yellowstone National Park, which has been evacuated due to completely unprecedented floods. You can literally see an entire building in the park disappeared, washed away. And it's that kind of thing that we're just gonna be seeing more and more of all over the world. So this is no joke, this is no joke. And we have got to get busy deploying dollars and energy and ingenuity to tackling the problem. And the solutions are all around us. You know, they, they, it's not that we don't know how to do this. It's that somehow, you know, we continually fail to, uh, to act in our own interest. Um, and it's, and of course there are interests that are being served by the continuity of fossil fuel production. That's a whole nother topic of conversation. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for being here, uh, both of you. And I know uh, both Jesse and Joe had to leave early, but, but this conversation is really important. It's really timely. Uh, there are billions of dollars that we're talking about here in the budget request. The, this has been made a priority to budget is to prioritize. And, uh, and I think that it's really uh, fundamentally important to talk about adaptation, to talk about lowering emissions and the investments that we're making and how aligned they are with what we already want to accomplish and, and how it dovetails in. And it sometimes it's about spending the money uh, it's about how you spend the money you already have uh, as much as it's about spending new money uh, in, in a different way. So this has been a really informative and, and educational conversation. I hope that our audience has enjoyed it as well um, and I look forward to engaging with, with each of you again. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank Bye. you.